of cannabinoids and people are calling it synthetic marijuana. It is not synthetic marijuana and I think it's a it's misleading uh, to say that it is synthetic marijuana. Um, I have we have had extensive presentations from the DEA on this drug and I have been seeing it firsthand for three and a half years on our streets and I'll tell you two things. Um, one is that you cannot refer to it as synthetic marijuana because I think a lot of the kids and other people that are using it are thinking because marijuana is becoming legalized around the country and that marijuana is, you know, been deemed as you know, fairly harmless to your health, you know, much more than cigarette smoking, that people think that synthetic marijuana is certainly safe to use as well. That's not the case. Um, this, the synthetic cannabinoids are being uh, manufactured in China. They are very, very dangerous chemicals. There's a lot of <coughs> chemicals, there's acetone and other chemicals that are sprayed onto an inert leaf. Um, and those chemicals are not only extremely strong, but can have um, a variety of additional chemicals mixed in that can make them extremely dangerous. When I say they're extremely dangerous, let me give you a couple of examples. So what we saw the first time I encountered it, um, for those of you who've been around for a while and know uh, about some of the other street level drugs, PCP was always our worst nightmare. And I think for every major city, um, uh, PCP is one of those drugs that really changes uh, the personality of the user and so that they have hallucinations, they have superhuman strength, they become violent and agitated and very unpredictable. We, we fought that very, very hard in the 80s and early 90s to be able to rid the city largely of PCP, uh, although we still have some small pockets of PCP here in the, United, I mean, in the United States, in the East Coast, and in Washington, D.C., most of which is coming from California. Um, in my opinion, the synthetic cannabinoids that are out there right now today are worse. My first encounter with a person using the synthetic uh, cannabinoids or K2 spice, as it's called, uh, originally been called when it, when it came out, or Scooby Snacks, as some of the other names it was called, was I was driving down the road not too far from a police headquarters by the court building, and a car stops in the middle of the road, and the driver runs from the car, um, and I can see there's a person in the passenger side that was acting out of control. So we stop, we get out to try and help the driver, and meanwhile, the passenger had ripped the side view mirror off the car, had ripped the mirror inside the car off, put his fist through the dash, broken his wrist. In fact, his bone was sticking out of his arm and he was continuing to punch the dash. Um, and um, uh, he had ripped the gear shifter off of the, of the center console ship. And this was a person who was on his way for his drug test because he was <laughs> under supervision, so he was a block away from his drug test, but was smoking K2 spice because uh, it's not picked up by a standard drug test. Um, he clearly felt no pain. Uh, it took nine of us uh, once the ambulance got there to get him calmed down enough to get him to the ambulance. Uh, last week, I was out for less than three hours on the evening. I spent most of it over in the Trinidad area, Benning Road area. And in the first 20 minutes I hit the street, I encountered two cases of uh, people high on this uh, case of spice. Literally, the first one was just walking across Benning Road <coughs> at four o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of Benning Road. It's like his brain just shut off and he just stopped walking. And he slumped over, was standing on his feet, uh, went unconscious and just stood in the middle of the street rolling on himself, um, which was the way he remained until we got him into an ambulance uh, and got him transported. I ran four more calls like that while I was out that, that night. It is becoming an epidemic. The, if you, there's a very good article in the New York Times that came out yesterday. If you look at the New York Times uh, about synthetic um, cannabinoids in Syracuse, it is very, very disturbing to read uh, the epidemic level up there. We're also seeing a lot of use in the homeless population. So the reason it's very attractive to the homeless population, well, a couple things. One is attractive to anybody who has a, who's under any kind of supervision you know, the sound of these parole probation because they can go to take their drug test and they are going to test negative. Um, so that is the reason. And then the article from the New York Times will talk to you. They talked to a guy who said, I didn't really want to use this stuff. It's the only way I can pass my drug test. And he's an addict. You know, addicts are going to use. Uh, a lot of them are going to use and they'll use whatever they can and stay out. Um, so uh, it's very, very dangerous. The reaction from different people that we see using it varies widely from catatonic and, and zombie like to um, extremely violent. And the reason it's so prolific right now is one is the Chinese uh, 
is uh, the start of this market was in China. They are pushing it. The profit margin is unlike anything we've ever seen. So there's never been a street level drug in the United States that you can make the profit that you can make off of this drug. About a two thousand dollar investment will get you about four hundred fifty thousand dollars. So um, from what I've seen, and Commander Hoey just walked in, he's running the street level narcotic unit uh, for us citywide now. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, a small bag is about ten dollars. What people are doing is they're breaking that small bag down and rolling it into uh, single joints and selling the single joints out there one at a time for a couple of dollars a piece. Um, uh, some of them are actually mixing bath salts or some other uh, uh, drugs in there with it. Um, but for uh, persons that are in the homeless population who don't have a lot of money or availability to feed to their drug habit, whatever their drug habit might have been, they can afford this. They can get a dollar or two dollars and get a single joint that they can buy. So it is really ravishing the homeless and the uh, people living in extreme poverty. So um, the difficulty for us is we make a lot of arrests of people distributing this stuff. Um, the mayor, as soon as I talked to the mayor about it, the first thing she did was pass emergency legislation and thank uh, Jack and the council for helping get that through. Uh, is we're going to go after the businesses because they are legally selling in the businesses uh, around the community, gas stations, liquor stores, small businesses. Now they know that our narcotics people are going in and seizing this stuff saying, hey, we're gonna send it off to the lab and find out if this is the stuff that's been deemed illegal, so we're gonna seize it all um, until we have it tested. So they're hiding it from us, and it's a cash-only business, so people are coming in and paying cash for it, but they're hiding the drugs behind the counter or some other place. Although we have good sources, we know where it is. <laughs> And if you just watch outside, you can tell who's selling it because of the, the zombies standing around outside. <laughs> um, so she passed the emergency legislation, which we are signing tomorrow. Uh, and in fact, tomorrow we will be able to go and shut those businesses down. So if we go in, my folks go in and they are able to buy in an undercover operation in a business, I'll have the ability to shut the whole business down for 96 hours. So it's different, a loss of profit for the business if I seized, you know, 50 bags of it that they could have sold at $10 a bag. Now I can shut the entire business down. Because before it was just the cost of doing business, right? They just get 50 more bags and sell it. Now I can shut the entire business down for 96 hours, which means they sell nothing. Two, they can get 10000 up to $10,000 fine for the first offense. Second offense, they can lose their business license and $20,000 fine. So I think this is gonna have a huge impact on the businesses. Now, unfortunately, the stuff has been around long enough now that there is now a street level market. And there are wholesalers, from what the DEA is telling us, there are wholesalers that are warehousing uh, all around the region of Virginia and Maryland and uh, working its way into the business. So we still have a street level issue we've got to deal with. Problem is, is because they keep changing the chemicals, there's no statute uh, that says, you know, this, this chemical is legal. So when we seize it, if I, even if I catch you smoking on the street and I seize it from you, we can't say what the chemical makeup of the product is that you have, so we have to wait and send it off to the lab and wait for results. I don't need to tell you that the DEA is overwhelmed waiting for those lab results to come back, and wherever you send them to takes weeks if they get done. So we're, we're unable, we arrest people for distribution, but they're unable to prosecute cases. So everybody we've arrested have all been no papers, correct? All but one. Um, so now we send it off to the lab, we get lab results back, we can rebring those cases, but that's not gonna help us with our problem. So as I just told uh, the reporter who asked me when I was on my way here about this, we as a nation have got to get our act together. If we don't get our act together and deal with this synthetic cannabinoids now, we are going to be right back where we were in the 90s. Uh, you read the article uh, the Times where they interview a guy who is an addict that's using this stuff and you'll see exactly what I mean. The uh, addiction level, the, app, the impact, and the profit margin is going to drive violence, it's going to drive street markets, it's going to drive a lot of things we just don't want. So um, the, the mayor and the council's first steps are, are fantastic and they're going to help us tremendously, but the cat's out of the bag here and uh, putting pressure, you know, at the federal level to have ways to do an immediate field test in the field so we can, you know, test the stuff and try and get it off our streets before it really starts to become, you know, the open air markets that we don't want. That's going to be a challenge. So um, with that, I will stop and take questions. Uh, I will say overall, you're seeing a lot of stuff in the news about violence upticks and homicides and everything nationwide and across big cities. Uh, I will tell you, in Washington, D.C., all of our violent crime, uh, last year we, we drove robberies down 
percent. So huge drop in violence and robberies. Um, right now, our non-fatal shootings and, and the violence that we normally deal with is actually down. Uh, homicides were up by 11. We have 11 more homicides this year than we had last year. I mean, obviously, we had the horrible uh, Savopoulos case, which was four murders at one time. Um, but the number of actual non-fatal shootings is down, and pretty a pretty good drop in those non-fatal shootings. It's unfortunately, you know, the violent acts that we have or the shootings we have are much more lethal. So um, overall, the number of violent crimes are down, but we still have a challenge ahead of us. 